everyone. I'm Rebecca Lowe and this is our Premier League on NBC podcast number two as we try to keep you all company there at home whilst the Premier League is of course postponed for now. Now this week we have entered the modern world. We are no longer phoning in on a conference call. We have all got onto Zoom so hopefully you can hear us better and if you're watching as well on YouTube on the NBC Sports YouTube channel you can see us as well. There we all are in our homes across the United States and the UK as well. This week, as you can see, we've got top left Lee Dixon, Graham Lasso, Robbie Earl, Robbie Musto, and Carl Martino. And chaps, it's lovely to see everybody and miss you all. Um, we're going to talk this week um, about, obviously, it's a challenging time for everybody right now, no matter who you are across the world. Um, and we, it kind of got us thinking about other challenging times in our lives and in our careers and how we best handled them and how we now reflect and look back at those. Obviously not comparing to what anybody's going through right now, but just in that theme of challenging times. So Lee Dixon, all the way over there in Barnes in West uh -huh. London, I'm going to start with you. If you could take us back to a time in your career, Lee, where you felt it was really tough, what happened and how you dealt with it? Well, Rebecca, I'm going to go back to uh, 1990. I think it was October 1990 of that season, 1991. It was a season that ended really well for us and we won the league for my second time at the time. Uh, obviously, the 89 victory was, was well documented, but Liverpool then went on to win the league in 90, which is their last time they've won it. And uh, looks like they're going to win it again very shortly, uh, hopefully. Um, but then we won it again in 91 and um, that season, so I've not been at the club that long, so just still trying to settle in, still trying to make my way in the first division as it was then which is now the Premier League and trying to work out um, as a young man what it's about playing at that level. Um, I had a reasonable amount of success early on so going into that season we were confident um, and then we went to Old Trafford in October and um, it was a feisty affair to say the least and there's a lot been made of the, the battle of Old Trafford that we recently saw the one with um, the Van Nistelrooy one but that was nothing compared to the one back in 91. And I don't know whether the boys remember uh, back then. Robbie Musto will, because he's really old. Um, as old as me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there, was a, there, was a, there, was, there was rumblings with Arsenal and Manchester United back then. There was a few little feuds that were going on. Noticeably, Nigel Winterburn and Brian McClare. Because something happened at, old, at uh, Highbury where he, Nigel took the mickey out of um, Brian McClare for missing a penalty. So there's a bit of niggles. They came across each other quite a lot on the pitch because they played opposite each other. So there's a few little kicks here and there. So after that game, we, we go to Old Trafford and then um, there was a couple of little niggles going on during the game. The referee, Keith Hackett, I think it was at the time, was trying to keep control of the game. Um, Anders Limpar scored that brilliant goal from a corner, took a short corner and whipped it into the near post and uh, caught the keeper off the line and the goal was given. We ended up winning the game 1-0, but in the second half, there was a couple of tackles that started to flare up. And I was on the far side of the pitch at the time when Nigel went in for a slide tackle with Brian McClare um, and all hell broke loose. Um, and I was probably 40 yards away at the time. So when you see something like that, Robbie Earl will tell you he was probably the first to arrive when there was any skirmish going on as a, as a peacemaker, may I might add. <laughs> Thanks, Dickie. You, so, you couldn't see him for dust when there was a fire going on. <laughs> that's, that's another story. Well, because um, I was going the other way. <laughs> so, the, what happened was the, there was a bit of kicking on Nigel on the floor and then everything all went off. I think uh, Anders Limpar came in to try and protect uh, Nigel and decided that the best way to protect him was to throw the biggest right hook I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> Landed on Brian McClare's ear and split his ear completely open with one punch. And uh, Keith Hackett nearly took one in the in the mayhem that, that ensued. And the long the, the long story is I could go on all about, all night about the fight, but it's what happened afterwards. The game finished. We won the game one nil. Um, but the FA stepped in and started to look at the incidents and quite rightly so, there was players fine, David Rocastle, Paul Davis, uh, Anders Limpar, Nigel. I think we had about six players who were fined, um, you know, quite a lot of money for the incident and a couple of United players. 
But then the FA decided in their wisdom to dock Arsenal two points off the total of the, at the end of the season. Well, at that point, we would dock two points. Man United would dock one point, which we couldn't quite understand why there was any difference. It was a melee. Everybody was involved. And for some reason, we got two points. So George got us all um, around in a circle at the training ground and decided to do one of his um, almost Winston Churchill speeches about sticking together, about um, being a family, about in adversity, you get drawn together. And it just reminded me of what's going on at the moment, that you need to have your family around you. And Arsenal was a big family. We were... um, very close-knit bunch of players. The lads will tell you that team spirit was one of our biggest strengths, but very similar to what Robbie had at Middlesbrough and Robbie Earl at Wimbledon. He kind of knew that they, they would be all fighting for each other in the right way. Um, and, but what happened was um, George set out a, a, a kind of backs against the wall, linking arms mentality where we wouldn't let anybody in. The press wanted to talk to all the players. He wouldn't let any players talk to the press. And we kind of grew strength from the fact that we were a big unit and we were, we were together all in this, trying to fight this common enemy that was basically the outside world. And as I said, it was quite, I was still quite young in my career. And it, it, it kind of was my first lesson in trying to um, understand the, the real um, nuances of, of being in a team. That was the first time it really clicked. And yes, we, we were absolutely out of order. Uh, both sets of players should have been fine. There should have been um, points deducted, not differently in my book. But it, what it did for me, it taught me in a, in a, in a situation that was, that was perhaps looked from the outside as being a really bad one. We grew strength from that. And actually, that was my first lesson into you, what you can achieve with a group of players when everybody else is against you. And um, Obviously, with what's going on in the outside world right now, um, I'm not saying we all go around having a fight at Old Trafford. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that, you know, there's people around you, the simple things in life about just having your mate next to you, um, we take for granted at times. Dicko, it sounds to me like George Graham was obviously a real manager of men, a real leader, especially at that time. And you were young, so you needed that. But do you think that right now, when you think of the Premier League clubs and you think the managers, that their role now let's think of Mikel Arteta, for example. I know they can't be with the players, but do you think their role in this very moment has taken on a whole new dynamic that, of course, they never planned for, but they're going to have to face by trying to instill that kind of all-in-it-together mentality and positivity from a distance right now? Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think sometimes that managers, and certainly players do, they take that, their position in a team and in a club for granted a little bit at times. And I think it is times like this that perhaps the head, the figurehead, George was then to us, stands up and actually, um, there's a lot of mutterings going on in the world right now and, and conspiracy theories and, and chats and all of that sort of stuff. And it's, it's, the, it's the leaders that, that stand up and actually calm everybody down. And at a moment like that, George calmed us up because we wanted to fight the world at that point. You know, everybody was against us. We were, you know, right, that's it. Let's, let's fight the world. We, we're not going to take this. And he calmed us all down. He wanted us to be calm. He didn't want us to be uh, hot-headed. And I think the coaches and managers that you've said now, there's obviously a lot, huge amount of emotion flying around everybody at the moment. And quite rightly so. Not just football, but any, every walk of life. And we've kind of just got to all calm down and just breathe and actually just listen to the people in power and, and, and who hopefully the experts will be able to get us through this. Dicko, can I ask you a question? Yeah, absolutely. Um, how, how disappointed are you that uh, all, all your gigs at a coffee shop in Covent Garden were canceled? <laughs> <laughs> what is this hat? You're inside. Mm-hmm. No, I, well, you, if, you, if you'd have been on the call at the right time, you'd have heard my explanation, but you weren't. You were late, so <laughs> there you go. And with that, we move on. Carl Martino, great. Never. Oh, okay. oh no, no, I'm up. <laughs> no, I'm not going to you next. You're punished. I'm going to go to Robbie Musto because Robbie's looking so serene and so calm in his new lovely house in front of a couple of old shirts, framed. Love it. Robbie Musto, take us through um, what, what has challenged you or a moment in your career that's challenged you. 
Well, I, I think like everybody else, I could pick out multiple uh, situations where it's been challenging through different reasons. When you've been playing for as long as we have, there's plenty of them. I just think an interesting challenging period that I want to talk about is kind of mid-90s when the foreign players started to come into the Premier League. And our club, Middlesbrough, not, of course, one of the bigger clubs, but their owner with lots of money that wanted to go places. And all of a sudden, in 1996, all these international players started coming into the dressing room. And you remember that, that, that Middlesbrough, we were a British squad. We stuck together. We got promoted into the top flight. We actually had one season back in, into the top flight with Brian Robson and we finished mid-table. Everything was fine. That summer, our world changed <coughs> because Fabrizio Ravanelli I just won the Champions League with the Juventus. We had this little Brazilian called Janinho that was a spectacular player. Emerson was another midfield player that came into the football club. Plus Italian player Gianluca Festa. All, all of a sudden, the dressing room had changed. And for us, it had been there for many years. It was, it was kind of difficult to get our heads around it. Now, I'm not saying it, was for the, for the, it wasn't for the worst. It was for the better because we, we went on and, and got to cup finals and had a, had a great run of games, et cetera, et cetera. But it was very different. The dressing room was very different. Obviously, the training habits of the players was different. We had players bringing their chefs to away games. Ravinelli had his Italian chef come and, and made his cookies every night and, and decided what we were eating at, at team dinners every night. Oh, OK, right, right, that's OK, we'll do that then. And ev everything changed. Um, and for little old me, trying to find a way to stay on this road with a club that wanted to go places and, 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 and shoot up the league and... It was difficult. Um, Janinho, Emerson, we had other good midfield players there. Um, meant I had to change what I, how I played. And, you know, I, I was never a great attacking midfield player, but that's what I was good at because I had energy to do that. Now, with Janinho coming in and Emerson and other players, I had to change, basically. And one thing I could do was run. And I could run more than everybody else. And I had a bigger heart than everybody else. And I would cover runs when Janinho and Emerson didn't bother covering runs. And, and I found a way in a difficult situation to adapt to the team and to that environment and to the squad to figure out what the squad needed. And I ended up being that guy, that worker to, to, to enable everybody else to play. Um, so so that, that worked out for me as well. But it, it, amongst all the, the situations, Rebecca, one of the biggest challenges, and we got asked about a lot, you know, the, the, the players that were there before, was the difference in wages. Ravenelli was reportedly on, and it was kind of factual, everybody knew at the time, £42,000 a week. And this is back in the mid-90s. And I'll tell you right now, my wages at that time was about four or five. And the question kept coming to, to the likes of me and some of the other guys, Steve Vickers and Kurt Fleming guys, the, the, you know, the, the, the other kind of parts of the squad, if you like, not the superstars of the squad, was how can you play in the same team with the guys earning so much 10 times more money than you're earning. And that in itself was a difficult thing to kind of get to grips with. How did I personally it make you feel, Musty? How did that make you feel? Well, I, I, had, I, had, I had no problem with it, Rebecca. Well, saying no problem, I, I understood what those, got, what those guys brought to the squad and to the team. And we went on cup runs and, and experiences Basically, because we had some really great players in Ravonelli who scored 31 goals in his first season. Janinho um, was an amazing player. So I, I, I understood the benefit of having those superstar players. But it, sometimes it did make you think, really? Are they 10 times more valuable to the team when you're in the first 11 like they are than I was? So, Robbie, yeah. do you think also, so interrupt, but do you think also that it depends on the character of the person? You don't mind them getting paid 10 times more than you if they're giving everything that you're giving and, and if you've got a perception that they're not maybe, you know, working quite as hard or not quite as committed to the cause, that's when you start to get that, that friction. Well, that's, that's a great point because, I was, you know, Fabrizio Ravanelli was a great player. He was a pain in the ass. He was an <laughs> absolute pain in the ass to the squad. And he went away on international duty when we were struggling in the Premier League. So we had all these great cup runs, but basically in the league, we were struggling. Um, and we'd go away in, in, uh, with his international team and do interviews saying, the team aren't good enough. The defence are, are terrible. You know, that's why we're not doing well in the Premier League. We're getting all the goals. We're not good defensively. Now, of course, that was big headlines at the time. He comes back into the dressing room and it's awkward. It's difficult. It was a difficult dressing room. And you're right, Graham. I mean, if, 
if those players, star players that earn all the money and get all the headlines and making a difference, they've got to be honest about that, but are not showing the same willingness, not rolling their sleeves up when you're fifth from bottom in the league table and you're getting booed at home, that are hiding in games. So that, that was a difficult part of it. And some of the players in our squad didn't like it and Must would, would fell, fell out with the star players. Musty, sorry to jump in. On, on that one, yeah. like, Graham talk, uh, Lee sorry, talked about George Graham being the leader then and taking all the address from him. What was sort of Brian Robson or those kind of guys saying? That's when you need somebody who can be a leader and almost talk to you why somebody's getting this amount of money or is that exceptional player is going to make be a benefit to you. He was one of the guys good... that were booing them in their home games. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. to, to be honest, he was, he, for me, he didn't do enough, Rob. He didn't no. do enough. He, he wasn't strong enough in a situation where the dressing room was getting a little bit out of hand and there was little cliques and the foreign players, the Italians are being in one corner, the Brazilians in another corner, the Brits that, that, were, that obviously stuck together and, and were the majority. But it, it, it wasn't a great scenario. And, you know, from the season before where we, we did all right, we finished, I think, top 10 in the Premier League that season. That was in 96, our first season back up. The following season, we had all these great runs in the, in the cup finals, but we got relegated. And so it, it wasn't as good, even though there were some star players in that team that went on and, and did other things at other clubs. Mm-hmm. But it just shows you the dynamic and the change of a dressing room. It, it, it's so important. And we do it all the time, Rebecca. We talk about it all the time in terms of players, uh, teams getting promoted into the Premier League. They change too many players, come in. The dressing room starts to go away. Other teams, I mean, there's examples of, of good and bad on both sides, but like the Sheffield United's right now, that pretty much stuck together. They bought some strikers to help them get the goals, but they've done marvellously well. So, so I just, I, I relate my experience back to some of the teams that got promoted. Too many changes, it just doesn't work. Musty, that, that responsibility for me, like when all the French lads came into our dressing room, um, after Arson came, 96, 97, it, it was... He had, no, he had no influence in that dressing room whatsoever, Arsene Wenger. I'm talking about Brian Robson, whoever, it didn't matter. Yeah. It was all about the guys in there, and we policed that mm. dressing room itself. Those guys as well, Robbie, Robbie was the same. You know, that Wimbledon dressing room, you couldn't go in there and start throwing your weight around or not trying or, you know, putting 50% effort in because you, you'd get found out and they would, they would sort you out. And I think that's, that's the difference where the, man, a really, the top managers can create an environment that, that polices itself within those walls and you very rarely have to step into it. It does it itself. And I think if you can get that balance right, then it takes so much weight Dicko. off his shoulders. Yeah, the only thing with that, and I, and I agree with that, but you, you add, you've got a personality as big and the playing background as Ravenelli coming into little old Middlesbrough. I'll tell you what, it takes, it, it, it would take a, a lot of big personalities because he's allowed... <clears throat> He was very loud, very obnoxious, very demanding, very moody. And it's difficult. I know what you mean. And that's an ideal scenario that you, you know, you pull these players and you, and you bring it back to, together again. But it wasn't easy. And, and it, and I, and Especially when he's yeah, scoring we, goals. Yeah, he scored 30-odd goals. Exactly. And he, and he was a star player. And for him to be moody and be the pain in the ass in the dressing room um, was difficult. Do you keep in touch with him, Robbie? Hey, hey, by the way, <laughs> by the way. I, I, I go to his third wedding next week. I could, I could hand, I, I, I didn't mind Ravonelli. And we, we got on absolutely fine because he appreciated what I brought to the team. He did, he hated some of the slackness in training. We had, we had no training ground then. We used to jump on a rickety old bus and go, and go to some crappy old training pitches. So he, he rightfully, he, he, he kicked up a fuss and we got a new training ground and it helped. But a lot of the other players that maybe were, were more envious didn't react well to Ravanelli and was fighting with him uh, physically in training sometimes. I, I mean, I didn't, I never got to that with me. I, I respected what he did. I, I understood the importance of the team for him, but certainly it was um, M- testing Musa, times at the club. Musa, just a little, a little line on Janino in training. What was it like in training? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm not sure how many of our listeners and viewers remember little Janino, but when he first <sighs> came in, it was, it was jaws on the ground just doing simple dribble through cones drills that was like, wow, we don't do it like that. <laughs> um, very, very quick, very dynamic. Um, the biggest heart, I mean, he was a brilliant person as well, Kyle. So apart from his skills and his abilities, he wanted to come to Middlesbrough. He wanted to do well and he did do well. So I can't speak highly enough. I mean, we all get asked, 
who's the favourite players, that we, the best players that we played with, Janino by a mile for what he did at our club and his attitude, his heart. But you're right, mate. His skills and ability and quickness was, was stunning. Hey, Mark. Uh, let's come to you. Thank you, Musty. That's great. Um, what, <laughs> talk about a challenge in your career and how you dealt with it. Um, well, I'll talk about a challenge in my career that will also be me educating my English mates on what a trade is. Um, you know, I know Musto's an American and, uh, you know, huge, huge Patriots fan. So he understands trades, uh, for sure. But, um, I was, uh, and also drafts. So, uh, I got drafted to Columbus out of, out of college. I decided to leave school early. Um, I had a chance to go play in Portugal before college and decided not to do that. And so when I landed in Columbus, um, I had a kind of quick rise after a really bad start where. The coach didn't like to play young players. It took me a, almost a, a fourth or a third of the way through the season before I got my first start. And the trouble is it was two World Cup veterans, a Colombian international and, uh, and John Harks that were the center midfielders. And so um, finally broke into the team, had a great first season, got into the U.S. side. Um, you know, second season was, was really well, got the number 10 jersey. It was all going great. And, and my, my career, career trajectory was on the up. I was getting more calls into the U.S. team. I was playing in international tournaments. And then we had a new coach come in to Columbus. And, and he and I uh, did not see eye to eye. Um, he thought I should defend. I thought I shouldn't. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, it, it was where my performance, and, and in hindsight, I can look back and see it now. I was, I was kind of, I was believing my own hype, and I was getting – I was getting too big for my britches and he was doing me a favor that I didn't accept, which was try to help me get back to, um, you know, be, being a player that could impact every game rather than having these ups and downs and only when we were playing well or only when I was getting a lot of touches or only when, you know, things were a certain, a certain way would I, would I be able to take over a game and then disappear. And he was trying to help me through that. And I, I didn't see it when I was young. You know, you're, you're in this weird world of like every day, it's just tunnel vision, next training, next game. And so sometimes he would do things that would, that would really annoy me. But now I see how much he was trying to help me. For instance, he wouldn't call fouls on me in training. So I would hold on to the ball too much. And he was like, all right, we're, we're going to show, show this guy that you can't do it to, to set up fouls in good areas and all this stuff. <laughs> sometimes you don't get the calls. And so he would get someone to kind of follow me around and kick Oops, sorry. Kept the crap out of me in uh, in training every day, and uh, it, it it like got me really upset. And it would get me. There were a couple times I kind of blew up, and he was trying to teach me a lesson that I didn't see. And so I request I requested a trade, and um, I remember it really well. It was such a tough decision because I loved Columbus. I I, I bought a home. I was I was creating a life for myself. I was twenty three, and um, I was in the U.S. team. Everything was going great. And, and, and I, I kind of threw this huge disruption in my world because I couldn't handle this challenge this coach w was, was throwing for me. And um, I remember it. I was in my house getting ready. To, I was fixing a light fixture because I was going to put it on the market. And one of my really close friends on the team, this guy John Walniak, was up on the ladder. And I was like, what kind of teammate I am, by the way. I'm like holding the ladder. He's up there fixing my light fixture. Um, and, and I got a call right when he was up the ladder. And I was like, hold on, mate, it's steady. And, uh, and I got on it. It was my agent. And he said, you know, trade went through. You're going to L.A. Um, it's, actually, it's actually for two players. It, it's a combo deal. It's, it's you and John Walniak for these two L.A. players. And, and, and John was definitely not looking for a trade and, and was up on the ladder, bless him, fixing my light fixture. And I was like, oh, no. Um, so because I forced this trade, the only way the Galaxy were going to do it is um, they were giving up a big player but wanted two players. And um, to explain trades to you guys, you can't actually buy a player. You just say, I want that player. I'll give you this player for that player. It's pretty simple. I mean, it's like playing cards. Thanks back for the explanation. Thanks, Thanks for explaining that. Great cool. It's not, it's not easy. It's not easy. Um, you can call me after the podcast if, if that wasn't clear. <laughs> uh, so then what's crazy about trades and, and transfers are the same, but there's a whole window and there's time to think about it. That, that day, 
it was like 1 p.m. The call came through. I was on a flight with John that night because the Galaxy had a game the next day. We flew in, landed really late in L.A. that night, met the manager at the time and the GM, who was Alexi Lawless, for breakfast. And then I was in the L.A. Galaxy locker room putting on my jersey and all that stuff. I hadn't had a training session yet. I, I, we had just played L.A. Th uh, three weekends before, and I had scored the winning goal. So I was like, hey, guys. And um, – I started that night and it was this crazy thing of being thrown into turmoil of like, you, you know how habitual our world is, same drive to practice, you know, same place that you sit in the, in the training ground in the locker room, your, your, your stuff's the same way, the physio, I, I was meeting people while I was getting my ankle taped. And, um, you know, I, I do think of like four or five players that came to me in that moment because I think other players are like, listen, buddy, get, like, figure it out quickly. I've got a game. I'm not going to change the way I prepare because you don't know, you know where, the, where the training room is. And so there were four, four or five players that really immediately took me under and a couple from the national team that, that realized how off-putting that was and how crazy it was to be in a new locker room and be in such turmoil. And, um, yeah, I mean, it just – it goes to show mm. – and I'm sure you guys had similar experiences when you moved clubs. It's like that, 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 that brotherhood and that camaraderie, it, it's, it's sort of quick. Like you have to get to that level with people really, really quickly and, and put a lot of faith and trust in people that in a weird way are competition with you at, at certain moments. But like, it's this kind of put it all aside. We've got something to do together. And I kind of feel like, you know, that I've been thinking of that moment because right now is all this, like, you know, we, we, we don't have the ability to lean on each other and be there like we normally are and, and see each other in the, in the, in the, in wardrobe or in, or in the, in the makeup room or you guys in the, in the van before the game. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's nice to remember how good that feels, but it's just tough to feel that feeling right now. So, um, you know, sometimes oh, it's you, just recalling on it. Did you, so the Columbus experience with the coach, did that help you at LA? Did you take on some of the, the lessons that was, was, was kind of trying to be taught to you at Columbus? Did you change as a player based on that bad experience? Um, no. Uh, <laughs> How did I know that was going to so, be a no? <laughs> so I think, I think what happened was um, I got a little bit complacent at Columbus because two things. One is I didn't have to be at my best every week to start. And I also didn't have to be at my best to get, in, get into the U.S. team. And when I got to the U.S. team, I was at my best. It, I, I, wasn't, I was disrespecting my club team by not bringing my, my highest level because, I, in a way, I was getting away with it and not, and not really picking up on some, of these, on some of these lessons. And then I could go away with the U.S. team and, and find that level again, which is unusual. Typically, you know, you can't kind of switch it on, switch it off. And so – L.A. was just a new challenge, so I, I didn't learn the lesson. I still was a brat. I, I still thought that he was against me. Um, but I had a new locker room to earn credit from because, like, these guys didn't care what I was doing with the U.S. team or with Columbus. Like, week in and week out in training, I had to prove to those guys that I deserved to start every weekend. So that, that started to bring my, my best level back. And also, you know, Beckham and Abel Xavier and so, some of these other veterans that – it wasn't – Beckham was a really quiet guy in training. He, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't talk much, but there was, a lot, there was a lot of standard setting through how you performed and how you trained. And so L L.A. Was, a, was just a different, more challenging environment with Landon and Kobe. And so you, you kind of couldn't float in L.A. like I got away with in Columbus. Hmm. Hmm. Great stuff. Really interesting, Kmart. Thank you. Um, the Ulster coming to you in uh, Long Beach, California. Over to you, my friend. Yes, Mom. Um, so I'd like to take us back to April 12, 2000, which is nearly 20 years ago, which mm. was the last time professionally I kicked a ball. Now, the circumstances around it were all a little bit strange in that um, Joe Kinnear, the year before, had had a heart attack. He had to leave the football club. We had the Norwegian national manager, Egil Olsen, come in and take over the football club. I mean, people remember him. He was <laughs> well known for wearing uh, Wellington boots and having facts about how high mountains were and all those things. 
unfortunately for me, didn't quite understand Premier League football as maybe we would have hoped. He came into the football club, he never quite got us back, didn't quite understand who we were, what type of club we were, the way we played. Almost, you know, as Graham, Robbie and Lee will tell you, you know, when you played Wimbledon, we were going to win the ball back, we're going to be physical, we're going to play high tempo, we're going to change the rhythm. He wanted us to be sit back and be defensive and, and, and passive and, and try and nip the ball, which just the wrong cap profile of players at the wrong time. And me and him, and I was captain of the club at the time, we didn't necessarily got, get on. And so it was quite an important game coming up on April the 12th, 2000. We were playing Sheffield Wednesday as the first team. And there was a reserve game being played that night. And I knew I wasn't in the first 11. So I went to see the manager and said, listen, if you don't think I'm going to be playing or you, you didn't, you're not going to use me as a sub, I'd rather go and play in the reserves and get 90 minutes under my belt and keep my fitness and hopefully if you do need me. And he kind of very quickly went, yeah, that's a great idea and shoved me off. So I went to play at Watford in the reserves, Vicarage Road in front of about 200 people. And um, we, we were playing that game while the first team were playing Sheffield Wednesday. Now, 10 minutes into the match, I had one of those moments where I'm heading a ball away, corner come out, young goalkeeper in goal, a little bit nervous, is coming shouting keepers. And as he's come and punched the ball, I've already headed it, and we both landed on the floor. And as we landed, his knee basically penetrated through into my stomach. And at the time, it was just like, wow, that's a really weird feeling. Didn't know anything more, kind of carried on till half time, got to half time, sitting in the... <clears> the um, in the dressing room and I shouted the physio over because I said something's wrong here and as we were looking my stomach basically went from a normal stomach to looking like I was nine months pregnant and basically the physio had a bit of a panic up said we need to get a hospital so we went to Watford Infirmary cut long story short they uh, kept me overnight did scans the next morning I had a bleed seven lost seven pints of blood panic got to get the blood out got to have a blood transfusion they knew there was some organ damage. Eventually, six weeks later, they found I'd, I'd torn my pancreas. Three months in hospital, lost four or five stone. I had a big operation, had to go to London. had a big op operation, had the pancreas sewn together. Fortunately, that did the job. Um, and that was basically the end of, of a football career. So it was kind of funny how fate took its course. I mean, I could have been part of the first team squad, not have been at Watford, but I did go to Watford. Played in the game, got an injury that meant I never kicked a ball again at a professional level. Um, the, the, the point I would say from there, Bex, and you say, I'd be really interested in, in, in where the boys were in terms of my mental health, not just losing my career. That, that's one thing that happened. And in some respects, that, was, that made the decision easy. I wasn't like, should I play another season or not? I couldn't play. That was it. I've got to move on with my life. But from the, the mental health side of, of, of being at the training ground, seeing mates who you'd share dressing room with and, and been part of the banter and, and enjoyed all that, but then were totally isolated, taken away from it, not part of it, looking forward, not knowing what the future was, not understanding what was going to happen next. It really made me think about times we're in now where people are in isolation, where mental health does become an issue, where... Maybe you play on a team on a Wednesday night with your mates, but that's not happening anymore, and how you cope with those kind of things. And just be interested, I know Lee had a longer career at, at Arsenal and maybe felt that he did all he wanted to do in his playing career. I always felt as though I got cheated of a year or two. There was a little bit of something missing. Mm -hmm. But mentally, I just made myself busy. I know, Graham, you, you finished with an injury, and I'm not sure if you mm -hmm. felt like there was just a little bit more you'd like to do in a little final chapter in your career. I think definitely your point, um, you know, Lee and I and Robbie, I think, were, were fortunate enough to choose when we stopped. I mean, I had a, mm -hmm. a couple of big injuries, but ultimately retired at 36, having not much left in the tank. Lee definitely had nothing left in the tank if you watched any of his final two seasons. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Kyle, as you, stopped, you stopped with a big injury, didn't you, Kyle? And, and Robbie, yeah. you, you, finished, yeah. you finished your career. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think there's a definite difference between that, that inverted commas, closure and mm -hmm. being, the, being able to decide and how that impacts on you and versus mm -hmm. having to stop with an injury. And, and, and I think that's a real challenge. And 
it's always concerned me, even to this day, that there isn't really any support for players no, that's a big thing, with yeah. long-term injuries and when yeah. they have career-ending injuries mm-hmm. in terms of that, that support getting them through it and the post-traumatic side of it yeah. that you inevitably get as a result. How old were you, Rob, when that happened? I was, I was 35, so I was coming to the end. But I, I think, like everybody, you kind of want to finish on your terms. I think I had a couple of years left. I think what Graham said is really important, Rob, because... What I did as soon as I finished was I did my coaching badges. I went back to college, did a couple of courses. I started doing TV and radio. I just got myself so double busy that I, in a way I didn't, didn't miss it. About three or four years later, so sort of towards my latter 30s, 37, 38, 39, there was a couple of times that I'd been to games and it really started to affect me as on my drive home back, you know, when you've been up to Newcastle doing a game or somewhere and you're driving back down the A1 and M1. And I used to always get the feeling like I'm no longer a big part of the show. I'm, a bit, I'm, I'm more on the side now. I'm just a little bit of an extra. You, you know, when you're a player, I always used to think when you go to games, you can often define what's going to happen in the match, whether you score a goal, stop a goal, create something or not. When you kind of finish, you, you feel as though that you lose a little bit of that power, a little bit of that strength that, that was the thing that made you a pro in the first place. Yeah. Robbie, now now you're a little older and wiser yeah. and have more reflections. Yeah. Do you now are you now able to look back at your entire career and see that ending almost as part of the story? And it, does it bother yeah. you now? Yeah, because I mean that's a really good point. You know, twenty years on, I didn't even realise how I ended up looking the game and, and whatever that I do. And, and actually, that decision to play at Watford and it was part of what <laughs> my story is. I think what, where the, the difference is, and Graham makes a great point, where some players end up having to finish, and regardless of the position of, of, of how much money you've got or not, or how your career is, I look at somebody, and, and it's really interesting, and I hope we're not talking about the end of his career yet, but Jack Wilshire is, could be a point and example. It's somewhere tw- 10, 20, 30 years after his career is finished, mm. I think he's going to look back back, and I think he's going to have regrets, and I think he, he might have some struggles with his life as he grows on, because the kid we saw dominating a, a European oh. game and we're, and we're thinking, wow, England's got one of their greatest, hasn't quite run out as, <clears throat> as you would expect. And it's really important, Earl, um, and I'm glad you brought it up. I, it, we, we have to be able to have these mental health conversations. And yeah. fortunately, athletes are starting to talk about it. And like, mm-hmm. I, I, I had to stop at 28. I can remember this conversation like it was yesterday. The U.S. team doctor put a recorder on the table, and we had to record my message with his that um, that my my professional playing career was over, and the recommendation of the doctors was mm-hmm. I couldn't play anymore. And like, I, it, it took me ten years to get over that, mm-hmm. and it's something I still I still deal with today. In hindsight, though, I started sobbing in that room, <clears throat> partly because. I didn't realize it at the time, but I was I did so much relief because of what what depression was doing to me at that point. I didn't I didn't realize it. And like, you know, it it we 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 get into this machismo world of we're supposed to be, yeah. you know, strong. We're not allowed to feel. You know, next game, next tackle, get up, do it again. And like, I think it's really important for young players out there to understand. And Jack Wilshire, whatever he's struggling with, you know, you hope he feels he's got the support system to say. I'm not doing okay. I'm like, this isn't well. And like, I, I, have a, I, I have a lot of challenges and finding people. And I think this climate has been good where people feel comfortable to speak and say, I'm scared. I'm, I'm frustrated. I'm tired. I'm angry. And like, you know, I, I think pausing to consider that stuff is so important. And like, I, I, I wish, you know, part of it for me was a trajectory as a player and a dream. And all these injuries I had came at these crucial moments when I had wind at my back and they reset me. And so, that's hard enough for any player, but if I had someone I looked up to that was that was that had a successful career or successful life and showing what it's like to live a healthy mental life with depression or anxiety or any of these things, man, I, I think it would have changed my career path. I, I I think one of the reasons I had to retire was was I was so defeated that each next injury took so much more out of me. Because I, I didn't have the tools to really get myself mentally fit again so that physically yeah. those things connected again. So 
Yeah, I'm glad I'm glad you brought that up. Well, you know, like speaking about mental health and and challenge and 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 difficulty is not weakness. Like that 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 ultimately is the strongest you could be is to be honest about how you're feeling. Before I get to Graham, just want to add one thing that we've spoken about quite a few times in the studio with regards injuries and persistent injuries and players like Wilshire, Andy Carroll, even Harry Kane at times and all the way back to the likes of Darren Anderton, who was nicknamed Sick Note. And I think that we've talked about this actually off air, and maybe one day we'll talk about it more on air, is there is this weird thing that humans do around footballers who get injured all the time, and it's kind of take the mickey. It's kind of like, oh, he's injured again, as though it's their fault. And there is, and if you put yourself in the position of somebody like Andy Carroll for one second, and imagine how it must feel all the way through your career to be injured. Everywhere you go, you get injured. Then you go back to your boyhood club, but guess what, he's injured. And we all do it. We're all like, oh, guess what, he's injured. He's injured again. But we don't actually imagine what it's like to be in his shoes to actually be injured. And same with Jack Wilshire. And it's, it is a worry for all of their mental health. And, and I'm just not sure that the, that the perception of injured players who are injury prone and obviously some humans are more injury prone than others i'm just not sure it's always fair i don't think they're always treated fairly by the media um when it comes to talking about them and often it's seen as it's their fault or they're weak in some way um and they should be blamed and i i just think that's a quite interesting topic that we can explore um maybe on another day but um graham let's let's finish with um your mm. your time i know you've had actually if you read graham's book anyone listening or watching read graham's book because he could have had a few different ones he could have brought up today a few interesting <laughs> times and challenges in his life my friend which one have you picked um i think um you know in this in this time where everybody's been affected by this particular coronavirus and the impact it's had on all of us and drawing on everyone's stories really about the sort of the need for human contact, the need for relationships. Lee talks about, you know, a, a situation of adversity that brought his team together, made them closer, made them more resilient, inverted commas. Um, and the other guys talking about various parts of their careers where there's been changes, big changes, and, and they've had to deal with that. And, and for me, I, th I suppose this time of isolation for all of us has given me a chance to reflect on probably the last time I felt that the world was shaken in such a way. Um, and that was 9-11. Um, and, you know, the world stopped. We live in a bubble of sportsmen where the show always goes on, but occasionally it doesn't. Um, and obviously after the tragic events in September of 9-11 um, in 2001, um, the world stopped. The Ryder Cup was cancelled. Um, people didn't travel. Um, lots of competitions, sporting events were, were cancelled. Um, and it, it, it was a, a terrifying time for everyone. Um, and I think it's probably in its own way um, comparable to now, the uncertainty of, of world events um, make us feel more vulnerable. And this is the bizarre thing about what we're going through at the moment is just as we need people um, when we have all these questions and these uncertainties, so we're being told we can only speak to people via um, you know, calls like this, and you can't even shake someone's hand. So that emotional human contact, I think, is really difficult. When, after 9-11, um, um, we had a game in, in Israel um, against Hapoel Tel Aviv in the Cup Winners' Cup, and um, uh, six of us didn't go. Um, so to sort of play into Lee's part about bringing a team together and in, in a difficult time all pulling the same way, six of us decided not to go to Israel. You can imagine the, um, the public sort of abuse almost that we, that we got for that. Um, the fact we had to try and justify it, the fact that a lot of the media tried to really uh, divide us as a, as a group, a, 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 a very strong group of players who, who had a real unity and, and yet outsiders were trying to sort of drive a wedge between us. Um, and for me, it was, it was that sort of conflict between being desperate to play and be part of my team, my family, my football family, but also the, the responsibility I needed to take for my own family. My wife had just had our second child um, in, the, in, the, in the weeks after 9-11 before the, before the match. And, and it was very difficult. We had two friends, their daughter, um, and my friend's wife was, was heavily pregnant with their second child who lived just south of New York, who had managed to get out and were living with us in, in our house just outside London. And it was the hardest decision I had to make. It was, it was the most difficult, the, the, the choice between my football family, and the guys will know about this and have all alluded to how strong those bonds are, and the personal choices I had to make 
on behalf of my own family and my responsibilities to them. And I, it just makes me want to really highlight that, that sports people, um, you know, they, they have human issues they have to deal with on a daily basis as well. We put on a, a great facade, a great front. I think as Carl talks about mental health, you know, we're designed and programmed to perform. And, and put everything that we're dealing with to one side when we step across that white line. And I think now's a time for football players, other sports people, whether they're Olympians who are suffering with the disappointment of having the Olympics postponed for a year, other athletes, and, and general people who aren't able to go to work, just to take that moment to actually look at what's important and, and try to get as much out of this time um, as, as they can. because. I think Robbie, Robbie, Kyle and Lee, they've all been, have all expressed what difficulties they've been through, but have all come out the other side with a positive reflection on it. It doesn't mean they're completely healed. Um, I know well, Lee well enough to know that he, it's going to be impossible to heal him. <laughs> but ultimately, um, there, there's situations we're going to find ourselves in that we have to overcome. And, and, and this is a great opportunity for us to actually reflect on what's important I think Kyle said the simple things in life are really important at the moment. And it just reminds me of, of that whole um, experience of, of what we went through. Um, on the upside, after that game, we played Leeds United, who one of our biggest rivals, Leeds United, when, when I played for Chelsea. And the response of the whole group was absolutely incredible. We've never fought for each other more than we did that weekend when we all got back together and we valued each other and valued the bonds. And, and actually all of us, I think, were stronger for it because those players that went, I respected, we all respected. And the six of us that stayed behind felt as valued um, when the team came back um, as we did before we had to make that awful decision that we weren't going to go. So it was a very challenging time and there was a lot of things we had to deal with. But, but out of it, we, we all... Um, took something positive and became, I think, stronger for it. Who was manager then, Graham? Claudio Ranieri, Lee, was, was, was the coach. And the difficulty was Ken Bates had a lot of bravado as the chairman um, and he, he decided that that game was going to go ahead. UEFA, we were the only game that wasn't uh, postponed or played in a neutral territory. And, and, you know, this was Israel. So it was, a, at the time, it was, you know, it was very much front and centre of, some of the things that were being spoken about um, around 9-11. Um, the Minister for Tourism was assassinated when the plane, our team, were in the air flying to Israel. Um, and, and so it was a very serious, serious time. The Foreign Office were saying, do not travel. Um, there were lots of things and signals and, and reasons why nobody should have gone. But we had to deal with the situation of a, what was seen from the outside as a divided, uh, divided dressing room. Bex, before, before we wrap, wrap things up, that was, that was great, Graham. Just from your point of view, obviously, we, we're talking from a football club and footballer's viewpoint, but for somebody like yourself who's been a role model for, for females mm -hmm. in terms of hosting shows, whether it's live in studio or live pitch side, is there any instances from your career, professional career, that, that have put the situation like we're going through now? Um. Yeah, a couple. Apart from being absolutely terrified, ever, every time I interviewed Sir Alex Ferguson, with my knees literally knocking together the very first time I ever saw him walking towards me, and I thought, I can't do this, but somehow managed to. Um, it's the February Moamba situation you guys probably all remember almost eight years ago to the day. White Hart Lane, Bolton against Spurs, FA Cup quarter final, and I was presenting the show from a pitch side desk with, um, a bit like the guys do now when Arlo has that pitch side desk with John Barnes and Kevin Keegan um, for ESPN UK. And John Champion was the commentator with, I think, Craig Burley. And it was, as you know, you might remember, very late in the first half, about 38, 39 minutes, and Moamba went down. And we were actually sat in the observation seats, which are literally behind the Tottenham dugout. So almost, I mean, a few, a few yards from the pitch. And we were sitting there watching all kind of the very tightly squeezed up. And we knew that something was going on because... He'd been down a while and you just know in a situation like that, you get that sense and you think that something's not right here to the point to which we were told to normally we'd be told to get out of our seats and go and take our positions at about 43 minutes. And it was about 38 and the producer said, go now, you need to go now. 
So we sort of had to cross in front of the dugout, which is never fun, and over to where the pitch side desk was about to be assembled. And then what basically happened from then on was one of those kind of, um, kind of fight or flight, really. Your body just went into um, autopilot. And I had to go on air within a few minutes of that happening because he was obviously taken off the pitch. And John Champion threw down to me, and there we were with Kevin Keegan and John Barnes, and I had absolutely no, not a huge amount of instruction of how long we were going to be on the on air for. It ended up being about an hour. Now we did go to break a few times, but obviously ESPN, because it was the FA Cup quarter final, it was a huge game. There were a lot of producers there, and they all had a lot of guests, and those people had come from the hospitality in the stadium straight way back into the trucks in order to try and help produce the show, which meant there was a lot of producers trying to produce the show. And for those listening in the US, we have open talk back in the UK, which means you hear everything all the time. Every graphics operator, every producer, every director, the PA who does the counting, everything. So I had a lot going on in my ear, but I had this, and that contrasted with this silent White Hart Lane, full of fans still, because they weren't sure that the game was going to be abandoned. John Barnes was very emotional. Kevin Keegan had gone through a similar thing with one of his players, um, Mark Vivian Foe, who had gone off on international duty. Um, and a similar situation had happened. And Kevin was getting very, very emotional as this was going on. So I was kind of dealing with both John and Kevin, trying to know that his family, because it was a Bolton player and they were playing away, there was a very good chance. Because I happened to have interviewed Moamba and I knew he had a young kid, or maybe two. And I thought the chances of his wife and children coming all the way to White Hart Line were probably small, so there's a good chance they're watching at home on TV. So I suddenly had this sort of responsibility to make sure that I was broadcasting to her, as well as maybe other members of his family, as well as the general public. Um, and it was, <laughs> it was hard. I mean, it, it brings shivers to my spine now. It was really difficult to strike the right tone between not being too morbid, because thank God he, he went on to survive and he's doing brilliantly. But of course, for a long time, it didn't look like that was going to be the case. Um, and we kept getting snippets of information about which hospital he'd gone to. And every piece of new information I got, I had to almost expand to fill the time without making it sound frivolous. It was really difficult to strike that tone, going to break, coming out of break, re-establishing what had happened, getting all the facts right. What minute did he go down? What's what do we know so far for people just tuning in? Because of course, I knew that we were the only company that had the sh had that game. So there were people turning on ESPN UK all the time to find out what was going on. So we, and eventually after about an hour and a quarter of this, the producers told me to end the show. And I mean, obviously none of this was written. This was all completely ad-libbed. And trying to end a show, rounding up something that had happened and saying goodbye and making sure you didn't sound too sad and too morbid, um, but they did still fade to black, I think. Um, was was far and away the hardest thing I've ever done. And then as soon as we came off air, I had to go on, and this was unprecedented, because this is ESPN UK, which was a big rival of those days, to Sky. I then went on Sky Sports News for the first time in my life, and BBC News, and ITV News, and Talk Sport, because I was kind of the, the only one on the scene. So I had to do a whole ream of, of interviews, got back to the truck, had a lot of sugar very quickly to try and kind of calm myself down, then drove home in a state of complete panic. I, not panic, more shock I think spoke to John Barnes and Kevin Keegan both on the way home and we were all kind of in that same situation and went to bed that night still in shock and terrified to wake up because I didn't want to know what had happened <clears throat> but as I said he somehow somehow survived and then about nine months later I was hosting an England under 21 game at Carrow Road for ESPN UK and he was my guest because he used to play for the England under 21s. I never told him that I was the one that was presenting the show, but I was just like, I, I, I found myself just looking at him during the game, like, oh my God, I can't believe it. This is just amazing. He was without doubt one of the most wonderful people I've ever met. And he's done such amazing things since that day. Um, but it's, that was certainly a moment in my career where I never thought I'd have, a, have to go into news mode. Real, real, that was a real first proper news mode I've ever had to go into. So, yeah. That was pretty tough. Well, well Beth, having, having worked with you uh, this, this long, um, I know that uh, we can fight like brothers and sisters, but there's probably no better person to be in that chair in that situation to do that right. I'm sure you were fabulous. Thank you, Kyle. I appreciate that. Thank you, mate. Thank you. It's, um, yeah. That's it hard. Like that... back to the, the things like that and the coronavirus, then pay, football pales into insignificance. A bit like now we're talking about, you know, as 
great it is for Liverpool to win the title, it just seems quite secondary to even be having those conversations now. In line Especially as the money as the weeks go on. You know, as each week mm. goes on and we're learning more and more people who are suffering yeah. and struggling with this awful disease, this awful condition, um, everything seems to pale more and more into insignificance. So, um, you know, I know I speak for all of you guys to say that we're thinking of everyone who is sick and the family members of those and everybody who is struggling and who has already gone through this and will, will continue to go through this. So um, I know I send everybody all of our love and our support out there and we thank everybody for listening and for tuning in. Um, thank all of you guys for sharing us with your really interesting interesting um insights into challenging moments in your careers and please make sure you subscribe um wherever you get your podcast to the premier league on nbc podcast and we will be here back here next week we'll also be on the nbc sports youtube channel so make sure you join us for that gentlemen it's been a pleasure as always we shall speak again next week lots of love yeah. bye mates yeah. Hi there, I'm Rebecca Lowe, studio host for NBC's coverage of the Premier League. Don't forget to hit subscribe to watch highlights all season long and tune in for Premier League mornings every weekend at 7 a.m. Eastern on NBCSN. And for more than 1,400 hours of exclusive Premier League content, make sure to visit nbcsports.com gold.